Greetings, fifth graders. Today you're going to be taking some time, a little bit out of our uh, history of North America. We're going to take a little bit of time to look at some art that is in the Kansas capital here in Topeka. And we're really lucky to have this opportunity to go to our state house and see the art that is within it. Um, we have one of the few capitals in the United States that actually houses some of the best examples of public art that is owned by the entire state of Kansas. And you can go to the Capitol and see this artwork pretty much just about any time that the Capitol building is open. Um, most of the artwork is located in two places, which is primarily the first and the second floors. There are some paintings and uh, other um, murals that are in the dome as well, but we're not going to spend too much time talking about those today. Mostly we're going to be focusing on two areas that are in the Capitol building, just in the first and second floors. So to start off with, there in the first floor, there was really one artist that painted most of the murals there. His name was David Overmeyer. He was from Topeka, and he received a commission from the Kansas legislature to paint eight scenes on just Kansas history. And it's in the first floor rotunda, which is the round part of the Capitol building. And he did so in 1951. And the titles of those paintings are The Coming of the Spaniards, The Battle of a Rickery, The Battle of Mine Creek, Building a Sod House, Lewis and Clark in Kansas, Westward Ho, and the Arrival of the Railroad, and the Chisholm Trail. Overmeyer finished those murals in 1953. And we're going to take a look up at just three of them today. The first one we're going to take a look at in um, order of when they happened is, first of all, the arrival of the Spaniards. And we've already kind of talked a little bit about the fact that Coronado in 1541 becomes the first European explorer to visit what would become our state of Kansas. His expeditions reached the central part of what is today Kansas, close to where Salina is at. He was, of course, searching for the gold-laden cities of Quivira, or also known as the Seven Cities of Gold. Instead, though, he found a land rich in beauty and other resources, but not so much of gold. And as we talked about, pretty much um, once he got to the central part of Kansas, he kind of turned around and went back. This painting depicts him exploring that area of Kansas, and you can see the use of sunflowers within the painting to represent the state. And if you look closely at the painting, you can see that um, the Spaniards are, of course, wearing their shiny armor, and they, in this particular painting, have a Native American who is traveling with them as their guide. And that is probably accurate as far as we know, um, that they did have some Native Americans who were there to help guide them across their travels, although their idea of what a city of gold was and what the Spaniards were really looking for were two different things. All right, and in the background, you can see the Kansas landscape for sure. The second mural that we're going to talk about is the Chisholm Trail. Um, Chisholm Trail was a trail used by cattle drivers to bring cattle from Texas, where they were there on ranges, and then they would bring them into Kansas, and um, they were primarily on the Chisholm Trail from about 1866 to 1885. It took about a dozen cowboys to drive 2,000 head of cattle. So that means 2,000 um, cows or steers. The herd size, though, that they would usually drive 
ranged from anywhere around a thousand to three or four thousand cattle later on. Um, this one is on the first floor rotunda in the northeast corner. Um, after the Civil War, the need for beef grew in the east, so they were bringing more and more beef to the eastern part of the United States. Cattle plentiful in Texas, but there was no really good way to transport them to market. So a man named jo Joseph McCoy started a shipping yard in Abilene, Kansas in 1867 near the Kansas Pacific Railway line. And another man named Jesse Chisholm laid out a trail from Texas to Abilene, Kansas. And each spring from that time frame of 1866 to 1885, cowboys would drive longhorns from the Texas ranges all the way up to Kansas. So you can think about the cattle that are right across the road from us and think about them being what these cowboys were driving. And again, in the painting, you can see that Obermeyer uses kind of the same coloring as in the other one. Um, he has a very stylistic use of bright colors. And you can see that he is using the Kansas background again of the sky and the flat plains of Kansas. The third mural that we're going to look at by Obermeyer is called Building a Sod House. Sod houses were built primarily of local materials. And what they would do would um, take native grasses and the roots that held the dirt together that the grasses grew in, and they would cut them into rectangles, and they would use them as building blocks for their houses because there weren't very many trees. And sod houses had to be rebuilt, or even just they had to abandon them because of water damage during the spring rains and even during the winter and also because they would frequently become the new homes for snakes and rats and things that people just didn't want to live with. Most settlers lived in them long enough to gather up the resources that they would need to build houses that were made from wood, which is what they were more used to from um, their eastern homes. <clears throat> and again, Obermeyer uses those same kinds of colors here you can see the man, he's built his sod house in the background there, um, and he will soon, I would imagine, because he's close to some trees, begin building a wood frame home for his family. On the second floor, there are murals painted by a man named John Stuart Curie, or Curry, some people say. The murals on the east and west wings of the second floor represent some of what is known today as the finest public art in the country. They were created by John Stuart Curry, who was born in 1897 and passed away in 1946. He was actually born pretty close to where we live in a town called Dunavon in Jefferson County, and that's just a little bit northwest of Topeka, kind of closer to Hoyt, in that sort of area. His paintings created quite a bit of controversy over art in public buildings, mostly because John Stuart Curry was not afraid to kind of make fun of politicians in his art. And he also wasn't afraid to show kind of the dark side of history a little bit. So um, he stopped his work in the Capitol building here in Kansas in uh, the summer of 1942 because he was receiving so many bad critiques by legislators. He left those murals that he painted actually unsigned because he was mad at the legislators for how much they were um, critiquing and being negative about his paintings. So later on, another artist was hired to actually finish the other spaces on the second floor later on in the Capitol's history, but we'll not be looking at those today. We're really going to be focusing in on these murals by John Stuart Curry. There are two 
murals on the second floor that Curry painted. The first one is called a Kansas pastoral. And uh, the word pastoral has to do with the word pasture. Um, so we're going to be looking at a farm scene, of course. And it's his attempt to show kind of how romantic and how um, amazing farm life would be in Kansas. And um, But Stewart's uh, critics didn't like how he painted certain parts of farming even. They critiqued him for the size of the cattle. They said that the sky didn't look right and that um, the farmer didn't look like people who actually farmed. And even on one side, some of the critics said that the nighttime prairie scene that we're going to look at could actually be mistaken for an ocean with a seal, which was actually a coyote in the painting, and ship masts, which were actually the oil derricks, you know, the pumps that you see out in um, Kansas with, that are pumping oil. So they were making fun of his painting, saying, oh, those look like ships out there in the background, Mr. Curry, when really they're oil derricks. So he was not happy about how he was being, um, his artwork was being critiqued by the legislators as they came and went to do their business. <clears throat> so this is the pastoral scene. Um, and like I said, they kind of picked on him about his animals and all sorts of things that were shown. They said um, that the Hereford bull that's right here in the center, that he was too red or that his body shape was too long and that the neck was just too thick. But um, there was a legislator who was also um, a cattleman and he actually raised Hereford, which is a type of cattle. And he actually defended John Stuart Curry by saying that, no, if you'd ever raised these types of animals, this was actually a very good representation and that this would have been an excellent animal to have on your farm. And you can see over here, here's the farmer standing in front of his barn, um, pigs, and of course the wheat back here in the background representing the wheat state that we were already becoming and that back in those times, wheat was not harvested by a combine. You had to go out and do it by hand. And then for the wheat to dry, they would stack these into these little, um, they would call them actually haystacks, so that the wheat would finish drying. And you can see in the background the Flint Hills and one of our famous Kansas storms brewing in the background. And the farmers looking probably at that storm, hoping that, it doesn't hurt his farm or his family. This is the other side of the Kansas pastoral scene, and this is the one that everyone said, oh no, that looks like an ocean over here. And this is actually a coyote right here, and this is the one they said, no, that looks like a seal. And in the background, you can see those oil derricks that they were saying looked like sails on a ship instead. And over here, we have the farmer's wife and the children. And, you know, you can see that this is a pretty simple life. But Stuart, John Stuart Curry wanted to show that, you know, the people were the main driving force of this part of Kansas. And so that's why they're made so much larger. Now, you really can't see it too well. But if you look over here, there's a little family of skunks. And John Stuart Curry actually painted those skunks in there to represent the legislators who were coming by and making fun of his paintings. So probably one of the most famous paintings that John Stuart Curry ever did was one called The Tragic Prelude. And it starts over the door of one of the main hallways. On the right side of the door, he paints the Spanish conquistador Coronado, like we saw earlier, and another man named Father Juan Padilla, which we really didn't talk very much about, but he's one of the first um, Spanish priests from the Catholic Church who's coming to um, try to change the Native Americans to becoming Christians. So, um, 
legends say actually that um, Padilla is one of the one of the first Christians who was killed in the United States, um, and the reason was is because he had come and he came to make friends with many of the Native Americans, and they actually grew to love him quite fondly. However, when he felt like maybe he had done all that he could do here in North America and that his mission was complete and he wanted to move on and go back, he was actually stoned to death rather than be allowed to leave. So that's a legend, but um, that's what is in some of the history from Dr. Uh, Juan Padilla. So this is the painting. You can see on the right here is Coronado again in his armor. And over here is Father Juan Padilla. Now on the left side over here, there is um, a frontiersman with a buffalo that he's killed at his feet. And in the background, there's another herd of buffalo, but in front of them is a covered wagon which represents the moving forward of people. And if you look in the background, it, does, it looks like a cloud, but this is really um, a prairie fire that's happening in the background, which then leads your eye into the next painting, um, which is of a man named John Brown. And John Brown was very much against slavery in the United States. And he believed that it was his own personal um, calling to help Kansas to not become a slave state. And he led many raids against groups of people in Kansas who wanted slavery. He also ra raided people in other states um, to keep Kansas from becoming a slave state. He was a key person in the Underground Railroad in Kansas which was a network of people who helped um, slaves escape from slavery in the South. He's famous for several attacks that he led and is part of the reason that Kansas is, um, at that time when he was alive, was known as Bleeding Kansas because it was actually such a controversial subject about whether or not Kansas would be a state that allowed people to have slaves. Um, he was part of a big raid that happened in Lawrence, Kansas, um, where many people were killed um, by people who wanted slavery to be in Kansas. And of course, we all know the outcome that Kansas did not become a slave state. So the most famous of the, of the finished murals by John Stuart Curry is the one that's called Tragic Prelude. And it is of John Brown and the anti-slavery movement in Kansas, the Kansas Territory. The painting shows a fierce John Brown. And he's holding a Bible in one hand and a rifle in the other. And again, Curry's critics disliked the way his color scheme looked. So they said it was, it was dark and it was negative. And um, they didn't always appreciate the symbolism that's in the painting. And remember when we talk about symbolism, what that really means is that the artist painted something into the painting and it really represents something else. So we're gonna take a look here at Mr. Curry's painting. And I bet when you see it, you'll recognize it. So this is the painting called Tragic Prelude. And again, like we said, it shows a time in Kansas's history when things were not so good. You can see that Stuart Curry actually put into his painting some symbols of the problems that were going on in Kansas, mostly between the people about whether or not they were going to become a slave state. The tornado and the fire in the background, the prairie fire, represent the storms of the Civil War that was happening in other parts of the country and also the fact that Kansas was actually warring against each other because they were trying to decide the fate of the state before it's even become a state as to whether it would have slaves or not. The men on either side of John Brown 
symbolize brother against brother in this conflict of the Civil War. And the two dead men that actually are laying at his feet, and you can see the blood that's in the grass, um, they represent the more than one million soldiers and civilians, so that would be people who weren't in an army, that were killed or wounded during the Civil War. And he's holding this Bible in his hand, and it has a letter A and then a, a letter that looks kind of like a horseshoe. These are Greek letters. This is A is Alpha, and O is Omega. And that usually represents the beginning and the end of something. So in the background, you can also see some flags. This is the Confederate flag, and we also have the United States flag. And what's interesting is that you can see there's quite a few stars here. So you can kind of tell that this painting was to represent a time when there were quite a few states already. So um, it's right before Kansas would have become a state. And since we're the 34th state, there's probably only like 33 states represented on the flag. But what's interesting is still in the background, you can still see that the settlers are coming west in their covered wagons, which means even though all this turmoil was going on, there were still people coming to our state trying to make a better lives for themselves. And that's what those guys represent in the background. Later on, you're going to come back to this painting and do some closer looking at some of the symbols and some of the items that are in this painting and what they might actually represent. Also, in the Capitol, we have some brand new art. And it was just installed last spring. In fact, um, we took a group of fifth graders there, and it hadn't even been unveiled in May last year. So it's pretty exciting that our capital still has new artwork that's being put into it. So this one was added um, to be a part of the anniversary of an important decision that was made in Kansas about schooling for children of all colors and races. This decision was made here in Topeka, and it became known as the Brown versus Board of Education case. And some of you I know have visited the Brown versus Board of Education building. Um, it's pretty close to downtown, but it represents the school where the children should have gone to, but weren't allowed because of the color of their skin. So the new painting is painted by an artist from Kansas City. His name is Michael Young, and this is a picture of him actually finishing the painting. So that tells you how new it was. This, this uh, picture was taken actually in April of 2018, so not that long ago. And this is the new mural. It's, this picture is taken before it was put into the Capitol building, so you can tell the building in the background is not where it is today. Um, but this was a really good image of the painting that I found. So it, was, um, it shows the struggles in America that was going on about 40 years ago where, or actually more like 60 years ago, where many children didn't get to go to the school that was closest to them because they didn't allow children of certain skin colors to go to those schools. Um, so they were separating kids by the color of their skin. And I know sometimes that's hard for us to understand because we don't really do that anymore. But that's part of why that decision of Brown versus Board of Education was really important to you today. And in the center of this painting, you, the artist showed a teacher who's teaching children of different colors. And you can see some more symbolism in here. She has some sunflowers on her desk, and that's to represent the state of Kansas and its role in this decision. Um, the painting here, or actually the photograph that he's representing, is of a man named Thurgood Marshall. And Thurgood Marshall was one of the lawyers who was defending the Brown family, saying that their children had the right to go to the school that was closest to them. Now remember that it wasn't just the Brown family. There was many families involved in this but, um, lawsuit, but one family got their name attached to it, and it happened to be the Brown family, and they were from Topeka, Kansas. Um, 
So that's Thurgood Marshall, and he ends up eventually becoming one of the first African-American Supreme Court judges later on in life, so pretty important guy there. Um, the globe represents the fact that what happens in the United States ends up changing much of what happens in the rest of the world. And over here in the corner, you can see this young man, a newspaper boy, and he's got the um, state newspaper, and on the cover, it you can't really see it, but it's actually showing the day that they decided that kids who had different skin colors could go to school with children who were white. All right, so today, you're going to be going back and looking at that tragic prelude painting a little bit deeper. You're going to work with a partner, and you're going to use a chart. I'm going to show it to you real quick looks like this. And you're going to use that chart that, and there's kind of an outline um, of the items that are represented in the painting. You have to turn in your own paper and what you're going to do is try to match what the items were to what they actually represented in the painting. If you're not correct, that's okay. I want you just diving in and thinking a little bit more about what was represented in the painting. So then on the back of the chart, there's an outline of the painting. And your job when you're done matching what you think those items really represented, your job is to color in the painting. And um, you can either try to make your painting look somewhat like the original one, or you can change it up and be completely different in your color scheme. And that would be something that we would call more like a pop art version of it. So make sure, though, you put your name on the paper on the side that has the uh, chart where you're going to match the items, okay, so that I know who it belongs to. Um, then if you need to, there's a picture of the painting in Schoology and Social Studies, or you can just back up this video so that you can see it again. So if you have questions, re-listen to the directions, ask your partner for help. You may work in no more than a group of four to do this. Probably three is going to be crowded, but no more than four people per group. Two is best. All right, so here's my sources because, you know, I should tell you where I got my information. And at this time, you can end the video, but if you need to go back and look at the painting, you are sure welcome to use the video to do so. Okay, have fun. I'll see you when I get done with jury duty. It may be tomorrow. It may not be. We'll see. I'll let you know either way on Schoology. Thanks, kids. Have a great day. I'm glad you got to learn something about art today.